Welcome to Easter at Mount Auburn at Stones Crossing. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us worship our risen Lord. Amen. Good morning, Mount Auburn, and happy Resurrection Sunday. If you're new, a special welcome to you. If you're here with us in person, you have an attendance card on your seat. Feel free to fill this out. Let us know you're new. And you can also stop by the Welcome Center, get some more information, and get connected. If you're a first guest online, feel free to email Melissa. Her email will be down below. Again, let her know you're new, and we'll get a first-time guest gift for you, as well as you can get connected through her. We just have a couple of announcements for you this morning. First, if you ordered Easter lilies and you want to pick them up, you can pick them up in Trinity Hall, along with a list of who's being remembered and honored. And secondly, if you are a guest with us or you just want to know what's going on, we have an upcoming event sheet at our Church Life Center, along with more information about upcoming events. So feel free to pick that up or visit our website for more information. And those are our announcements for you this morning, and join with us as we come and celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Amen. Hear this reading from the word of the Lord. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Would you stand with us this morning? If you're here in person or at home, let us praise our risen Christ. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let the earth be glad Let the people of God sing His praise all over the land Everyone in the valley, come and lift your voice All those on the mountain top, be glad and shout for joy Rise up and praise Him he deserves our love. Rise up, rise up and praise Him. Worship the Holy One with all your heart, with all your soul. Let the people of God sing His praise 
Worship the Holy One with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Rise up and praise Him. Amen. Rise up and praise Him. For he deserves our love. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. And we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Amen. By a round of hallelujahs, if you believe our God's alive, would you shout praises to his name? Amen. Hallelujah.
cry out our God's alive. Rise, holy fire, burn bright, burn bright. Rise with the shout. stood outside the tomb crying as she wept and she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus's body had been one at the head and the other at the foot and they asked her woman why are you crying they have taken my Lord away she said and I don't know where they have put him at this she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there But she did not realize that it was Jesus. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go and said to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. You may be seated.
Jesus walk there. I believe. I believe. Gethsemane, my Savior prayed there. On Calvary, he died alone. But the two You know, Bethlehem was where he was born, but there was really nothing very sacred about that manger. And in fact, Jesus could have been born in any hotel in any city if there had been room left open for him. But Jesus wasn't pushy, and he still isn't. He moves only in places that we make space, that we vacate for him. And there was room only in the stable that night. So that's where he was born. Jesus walked with common men, but you know there was not one common thing about the words that he spoke. He upset every comfortable act. He upset judicial systems when he said, love those who hate you. He upset patterns of religion when he declared that real, true temples of worship were inside the hearts of believers. He refused to discuss rules and laws governing people's actions, but instead he zeroed in on our thoughts and our attitudes. If Christ had been a philosopher, they could have debated him. If he'd been a warrior, they could have fought him. If he'd been religious, they could have ignored him as an eccentric or the greatest liar there ever was. But Christ was love. What do you do with that? Gethsemane, my Savior prayed there. On Calvary, he died. You know, Gethsemane was agony for Christ. In those dark hours, he cried in desperation, Father, Abba, Father, if it be your will, let this cup of your wrath pass from me. But it wasn't God's will. And Jesus died alone. But the tomb Jesus left there. I believe, I believe. God could have resurrected Christ right there from the cross. But he arranged for a full burial with grave clothes and a tomb and even a Roman seal. But after three days, he conquered death and Jesus walked out free. And the stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty. And now he lives and he will reign forever. And this I believe, I believe.
you stand with me one more time this morning as we together speak this Easter acclamation. We're going to do it three times. I'm going to say the leader part and you, see, you say the, uh, the all part with me and we'll do it together. Hallelujah. Christ has risen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. With all that you have. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let's give him one more shout of praise this morning. Amen. I'm going to hop up real, real quick up here. You guys can sit down. Thank you. You notice as you came in this morning, there's a, there's a card on your, your, um, your chairs. Those are... Um, attendance cards. You can also put prayer requests on them. And uh, if you fill those out, you can put them in the, in the offering plates as you leave the courts here today. If you're watching from home, you can email your prayer requests and your attendance in as well. Would you join me for a, um, a prayer this morning? We'll pray for our, our offering and also for our time. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your son Jesus. And this day, Father God, we proclaim that he is risen indeed, and he is alive. We thank you, Father, for pouring your wrath that was meant for us out onto your son who took it for us. Therefore, we do not have to what love you have for us because of your son we were bought with a high price and we praise you for that Lord we thank you Lord for your blood your blood that covers us we thank you for your blood that cleanses us as your word says it washes us whiter than snow Father, on this day that sometimes seems to get blotted out by other things and other traditions and eggs and rabbits and all of those things, Father God, we lift you high. We reclaim what Resurrection Sunday means because your son Jesus redefined what the Passover is. So this morning, Father, we just bring you praise. We praise you with our lips. We praise you with our hearts. We praise you with our hands. We ask, God, that you would speak to us through your word this morning. We pray that your Holy Spirit, Father God, would envelop this place and that we would be open Father God, to what you have to bring this morning, Father God. And help us to keep in mind that when we come to worship, when we come to the foot of your cross, when we come into your house, that we come bringing something as well. We bring you worship and praise, Father. And not just on a Sunday morning or a special day like today, Father God, each and every day, help us to worship you. For we are resurrection people. And we worship a risen Christ, not an empty tomb. And that gives us a reason, Father, to stand and proclaim, to let others know the good news. Help us, Father God, this morning to run to the tomb 
to find that it's empty and that you are alive. If we've never seen it in our lives yet to this day, may today be the day, Father God, that we truly have witnessed a resurrected Christ. Because you are real. And I know I have a witness in here this morning who can testify of your realness. And how you have worked in our lives. And we can look around us, Father God, and see the beauty of your creation. We can look around us and see how you've worked in the lives of your people. And so help us, Father God, to have joy in that. Help us to tell others about that, Father. We thank you, Lord, for this for this special day that is set aside and it's for you. Now, Father God, as we prepare our hearts to hear from your word, we ask that you would also bless our offerings, bless our tithes. Help us to give unto you, Father God, as you have given unto us. And now, because we can be in you, because we believe in you and we have seen and we can live an eternal life together as a family in the presence of the living God. We thank you, Lord, for having us in your mind as you made a way for us. As the cross was constructed, you thought of your son, Jesus, to be the perfect atonement, to be the perfect sacrificial lamb without blemish, perfect, sinless on our account. When we deserve to be separated from you, today we celebrate the fact that we have been grafted back in. We thank you for that. Prepare our hearts now, Lord, as we hear from your word, as as your messenger, as Pastor Jeff comes and speaks to us this morning on the the word that you have placed in, in his heart, Father. Help us to be open and to hear it and to apply it to our lives and to tell others. It's in the name of Jesus we say in agreement. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Andrew. Today we are celebrating the single most important event in human history. The resurrection of Jesus has done more to change the world than any invention, any election, any empire, or any political victory. The miracle of Jesus' resurrection has changed the world. Women have been liberated because of the resurrection. Orphans have been rescued. Slaves set free. Hospitals built. And entire oppressive systems of government have been overturned because of one single event inside a borrowed tomb. Jesus was dead, but God raised him to life. How important is the empty tomb? Well, let's go to this text, John 20, and let's see what it says. First, a word of prayer. Almighty God, on this morning, on this Easter morning, open your word that we may hear, that we may see you, hear you, know you. Your word for us today, Jesus, it's in your hands, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. John chapter 20 starts with this. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, why did people go to the tomb anyway? People went to the tomb because they believed at this time. If you went to the tomb the first three days after death, that their spirit still hovered They're near their body. And if I would go to their tomb, I would feel their presence. That's why people went. That's why they longed to be there for those first three days. Mary went early. It's still dark. She couldn't go during the Sabbath, so she comes on the first day of the week. 
It's before sunup. All the Gospels tell about that. And she wants to be there just when she can. As we go on with this, early Mary Magdalene, she comes up to the tomb. And in the first light of this new day, this first day of the week, she sees that the stone had been removed from the entrance. It's too dark to see inside, but she could see the stone, this large stone, had been rolled away. And what did she do? Let's go to the next verse. She turned around and she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. By the way, I believe in the inspiration of Scripture, of the Holy Spirit, but I love how John calls himself the one that Jesus loved. I, I love that. So let's see what happened. And they said, this is what Mary said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and, and we don't know where they have put him. Mary's still looking for a dead body. She's still looking for death. She's still trying to, to see where he is. Now, in verse 3, Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Now, I need, I need to tell you, I have no doubt that John's gospel was written by a man, by John himself. Look what it says. Uh, Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. And then it says, both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter. Now, <laughs> for all time, it says, <clears throat> I, I beat Peter to the tomb. I just want you to know that. I outran him. I won. I got the prize, okay? Just, just know that. That's how we run. A lot of guys think that way. Most of us do. I got there first. Okay, both were running, and don't forget, Peter was, was an older guy. His nickname when he was young was the giant. He was now a substantial giant, and John, by all, by all accounts, was young, probably in his early 20s, obviously easily outran him, and they made, you know, John got there first, but as John gets there, he bent over. And this is John. John doesn't go in the tomb. Now, I want to make sure you know, the tomb as he came up to it, the tomb door is probably about four feet high. It's carved into a, a side of a hill. It's all out of rock. And so as you look in it, here's this door with a couple of steps going down into a, a small room. On either side of the stairs go, uh, go benches on either side. It's probably about six foot high. And you find these tombs all over Israel. You still do. I was just, when I went, you, you see them, they're putting in new roads around Jerusalem. And, and our bus actually stopped at a road construction because they just uncovered it, three or four of these tombs. And you could look in and still see them. It's how they did it. So John runs up. He stops at the door. He's looking in. Now, the word looked in here is really important. It's a special Greek word. He looks in and, he, and he's... He sees what's there. That's what the word really means. He, he's evaluating. He, he knows something's going on really important. And, he, and he's looking around to understand its meaning. He looks at the strips of linen lying there. Let me stop there for a second. As people were buried at this time, they are wrapped in strips of linen with lots of aloe and, er, and spices and, and, and oils. It made the linen really thick and goo and hard and, and as and what he sees is, on the couch where the body was, on this bench, the body's gone. It looks like a just deflated balloon. That's what he can see from the door. But he didn't go in. Now let's go on to six. Then Simon Peter came along behind him. And he, I got to tell you, I see this. Simon Peter's this big guy, big guy. And he's running full steam. He's got a full head of, you know, a momentum, and he can't stop. So he just goes, boom, 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 runs right in. I love that. And then as he goes in, he saw the strips of linen lying there. Now the word saw here is a different word. This is the word we use when you evaluate facts. It's, it's what, um, if you like CSI, it's you're looking at all the facts trying to understand what's going on. He's evaluating what he sees. He doesn't understand what he sees. And so he's collecting data. He's looking at it going, what's there? What do I see here? He sees the strips of linen as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth that was over his face was folded up and set aside. So there's the 
the, the, the linen that was wrapped around the body was deflated, and then, but the cloth over the face was folded up and set aside. The cloth was still lying in place. And finally, the other disciple, John, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. Now, John saw, and this is a whole other word here in, in Greek, this means he, he has seen and evaluated. He saw and believed. He, he knows that Jesus has risen. Something has happened, he doesn't understand it, but he knows that Jesus is alive. When we go to the next verse in 9, they still do not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. They don't understand everything, but John saw what he saw and believed. Now, let's see what happens. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Peter still doesn't know. Peter's still thinking about it. He's trying to understand what is going on, and he's still trying to figure that out. But now we come to, uh, to the rest of the story. Now Mary, she followed the disciples back. She stayed. Disciples went back to their house, by the way. Did you catch that? Peter doesn't know what's going on. John believes, but they still both went back home. I always find that interesting. Mary stayed. And she stayed and she's weeping. It says crying, and the sense of that word is, I mean, she's wailing. Totally broken. She's still looking for a dead body. Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she finally looks into the tomb. Now, she doesn't see the grave cloth. She sees something totally else. Let's see what she sees. She sees two angels in white seated where Jesus' body has been, one at the head and one at the foot. Now, she doesn't look at the grave cloth. We see no evidence that she saw the grave cloth. But when you think about something, angel at each end of that bench, that gives you the, the appearance of the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. If you remember the Raiders of the Lost Ark, the movie, do you remember that? There, on top of the Ark there was the seat and there were angels that were carved above that and everything happened in the mercy seat. That's where the blood was put for forgiveness. The inference here is that Jesus becomes the mercy seat, which is an incredible thought, but she doesn't see the angels. She is so broken, she's just aware of people there. And so she goes on and says in verse 14, in the next verse she says, at this she turned around. Because I believe at this point the angels are sitting there and they become aware there's someone behind her, someone they knew, someone they recognized and knew who he was. And they go, um, you, you may want to look there. And so she turns around and she sees Jesus standing there. But she does not see that is Jesus. She's still looking for a dead body. It's not time yet for her to see. And, and so in verse 15, Jesus asks her, woman, why are you crying? Do you realize that's the same question that the angels asked? Woman, why are you crying? You, you, you don't get it yet. You, you, don't, you don't know, what you don't see yet. Why are you crying, Jesus asked. Who is it you're looking for? So, thinking Jesus was the gardener, you know, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go, I will go get him. Now, I see, I see Mary Magdalene as this, this, this maybe this smaller woman who, who's kind of wiry. And with a lot of determination, she's saying, sir, if you've taken my Jesus away, Tell me where he is, I'll go get him. If I can't carry him, I'll drag him back here. I'll take care of it. You know, I'm going to make it happen. I love that. I just think that I can see her doing that. And Jesus turns to her. She's still crying. She's still looking for a, a body. And she says, and I'm sorry, Jesus says to her, Mary. This is the shortest sermon ever given with the biggest response. Okay? <laughs> it's a one word sermon that changes everything. She says, He says, 
Mary. In that moment, she turns towards him. Her eyes clear. She looks directly at him, and she calls out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. He called her her name. She called him his name. The relationship has been renewed. The relationship has been restored. Do you see that? She doesn't care about the tomb anymore. That's, that's all done. It's all finished. She doesn't care a whit about the tomb. And at this point, she runs to him and, and grasps his feet. And then this is incredible verse here. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Lots of thoughts what this means. We know later you're going to see Peter... Um, Jesus coming in, Thomas, he's going to say, Thomas, put your fingers in my wounds. We know that in a few minutes, later on today, Jesus is going to appear to the disciples in the upper room, some of them, and, he, and he'll eat fish there. I mean, there's a lot of things going on. Most scholars say that what Jesus is saying, don't hold on to me. We got things to do. It's not time yet. You're going to see me again. It's okay. Don't, don't, let's not, don't hinder me. We got things, to, we, got, we got promises to keep. And let me tell you what's about to happen. I go instead to my brothers. Jesus says, okay. I got something to tell you. I got something for you to do. Go instead to my brothers. My brothers, is, this is the first time Jesus calls his disciples my brothers in the New Testament. Go tell them. And I am ascending to my Father. And this is where Jesus has given his word about, the, a prophecy about, I will ascend to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Now, what's that mean to say that Jesus said to her, go? You know, Jesus made a woman the first witness of the resurrection. Do you realize that? In a time when a woman's word could not be used in court as a testimony, a legal testimony. A, a woman's word was not valid as testimony. And yet God said, Mary will be the first testimony of the fact that I'm alive. We have a God that loves to use the least, the ones we don't normally count as witnesses to what happens. You know, for some of us, <laughs> for some of us, like John, it's enough to see the grave clothes. For some of us, like Peter, no, we got to see Jesus alive in front of me. Some of us, we need our name called. Let me give you an example. Um, even though I was uh, dragged to church often as a child, and I grew up in youth group, you know, when I was in high school and all that, when I went off to college, I pretty much left my faith home, packed up nicely on a shelf. And by the beginning of part of my sophomore year, I, I realized that I was a long way from God, if, you know, whatever. And I started a process of looking for God and trying to figure out where do I, where do I go to find him? What, how do I know what's true anymore? And I got in my hands a, a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And, and what that book is about by Josh McDowell, he's a lawyer and he, he presents the case, the evidence for an empty tomb. I spent about a year with this book. Because I honestly didn't know what I believed anymore. And I, and I figured the most important thing of, of the faith and the Christian faith was the fact there had to be an empty tomb. If there wasn't an empty tomb, then we really have nothing to talk about. And so I, I really tried to look at it. And I, I, I read this book and other things, but I, I came to the point to understand all the Roman letters we have talk about an empty tomb. The Jewish historians, Josephus and other, the stuff that we have gives testimony to the empty tomb. Let alone scripture gives testimony to the empty tomb. And I came to a point in my life to say, okay, the tomb's empty. 
as, 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 as much as we can prove a historical event, there's like a 99% probability this, this is real. The tomb really is empty. But see, for me, an empty tomb is not enough. I don't know about you, but it's not enough just to come to an empty tomb. It's empty. Everybody agrees. The Jews, you know, paid money to the guards to say they, the disciples took Jesus away. The word of the Jews that was recorded that they, somehow the disciples buried the body under a river somewhere. There's all kinds of evidence to give testimony to what happened to the body. The point is the tomb is empty, but is it enough just to have an empty tomb? For me, it wasn't. Several weeks later, actually several months later, when I was asking, I said, Lord, if you're real, I got to see you. I got to know you. I got to, this, an empty tomb's not enough. I, I, are you alive or not? And do a whole series of events on a Sunday morning in England of all places, I became aware that he was alive. He met me in the, not a garden, but on a street. I know that Jesus is alive. The time for standing at an empty tomb is over. Jesus is not there. Death does not have the last word. You can leave the tomb. Jesus is alive. Remember, the tomb is empty. The real question is, do you know he's alive? Do you really know he's alive? Has he called you by name? Have you heard him, have you heard him do that? Do you, do, you, do you know that as you looked at those grave clothes, do you, do you know he's alive? That his word is true. He promised to do this. Or like Peter, do you, do you need to see him face to face? Somehow, do you need to know his presence? Do you need to be aware that he has acted in your life in some way? Do you know that he's alive? I want you to look at what Mary Magdalene said as the, the last word we're looking at today. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. Now notice what she doesn't say. She doesn't say, hey, the tomb's empty. It's all done. Tomb's empty. That's good. No, she doesn't say that. She says, I have seen the Lord. She doesn't care about the tomb anymore. I have seen the Lord and he's alive. And she told them that he had said these things to her. <laughs> I hear an amen back there. That's the point. How do you see Jesus? Do you see him alive? Or are you still at the tomb wondering? The testimony of Scripture, he is alive. The testimony of the church over these past 2,000 years is that he's alive. We worship on a Sunday, the first day of the week, as a testimony that he, he rose alive on this day. The testimony, I would guess, of most of us here is that my Jesus is alive. I don't stand at the empty tomb anymore. I'm walking with Jesus. And that's made all the difference in the world. We're going to go to communion, and we're going to share in liturgy together. We're going to do a, a conversation that's appropriate for an Easter. May we prepare ourselves now to go to the, li li the living Lord. I need you to respond with me. Hallelujah, the, the risen Christ is with us. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Death is conquered, sin's power is broken. Praise to you, conquering God. We are yours, all yours, gracious Father. All our lives, all our thanks, all our praise, we give it to you with our bodies and our minds and voices. Jesus Christ, you are, you are worthy, worthy. worthy. Lamb of God who died and rose again. You are worthy, worthy. Worthy when you preach good news that God's kingdom had drawn near to learn and show the world what life in God's realm meant. Healing for the sick, new life for the dead, cleansing for the lepers, freedom for the possessed, new birth, new hope, new creation, breaking in for all. 
worthy above all. Worthy to that night we were we betrayed you. When you took bread, blessed it and broke it and gave it to your disciples. Worthy when you told them, this is my body broken for you. Remember me. We remember. Worthy when you took the cup, praised God and shared it. And worthy when you said, this is my blood of the new covenant for you. Remember me. And on this day of days, we proclaim above all, worthy were you when the angel rolled away the stone and you came forth from the tomb, trampling down death by death and to all in the graves restoring life. We remember and we praise you with our lives. We remember and we praise you with our lives, these gifts of bread and wine, proclaiming with one voice the mystery of faith, Come and fill this feast, Holy Spirit, this day and every day until that day when we eat it new at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And our Easter rejoicing shall know no end. All, All blessing, blessing, honor, glory, glory and, and power be yours, Father, Father Son, Son, Holy Spirit, Spirit now amen. and for, forever. Amen. amen and amen. On that night so long ago when Jesus took bread... This is my body, broken for you, broken, so we can be in relationship with him in a new way. This is the cup. He lifted up during the service and said, this is my blood of the new covenant. This is the cost of Easter. This blood has to be shed. A sacrifice has to be given for the justice of God to be met. This is the cup that Jesus drank, the cup of God's wrath, so we can drink the cup of forgiveness, so we can be in a new covenant with him now, so we can enjoy the full fruit of what Easter means, the victory that is ours when we put our faith in Christ. This cup is for us. Let us pray. Father God, I ask that you would bless these elements Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. Make them be for us the celebration of a new relationship with a living God. Jesus, this is for you to be with you and to be in you right now. It's your testimony. It's your promise by what you gave us on Good Friday, by going to the cross and dying. The promise is you are alive. And because you're alive now, you tell us we, we, will, we are alive too. We who deserve death now are alive. We, not just now, but we get to be with you alive forever. It's the promise you have made. So Jesus, bless, bless these elements and prepare us now to enjoy your presence again. Amen. If you'll take your cups and put the bread on the top, and if you'll peel it back, and take the piece of bread. This is what Jesus did for us to give us new life. Take and eat. Everybody got this? Anybody need help? Just put your hand up. We'll help you. Okay. Take the cup. Make sure you turn it over. Put the cup up high, you know, hold it tight and peel the top back. This is the cup of promise. New life. A new relationship where he calls us by name alive. Take and drink. Let's pray. Almighty God, we don't need to worry <clears throat> about going to the tomb. We know it's empty. And the amazing thing is, Lord, you are alive. Father, I pray, call us by name. Call, help us to see you. Help us to know you. 
Use these elements. Lord, if we know you now, I pray, deepen us. Pull us closer to your heart. Pull us into your heart that we may sense your presence. May we know more of you, more of your spirit in our life so that you can have more of you kind of showing through us today. I pray, Lord, for each of us here and all of us within the sound of my voice. Lord, I ask for your blessing. Father, may we understand we have new life in you. You have freed us from the bondage of sin, and you've given now, given us a choice that we can live differently. We can choose to follow you every day, and you empower us through your Spirit to do so. Father, you have freed us from the fear of death. Oh, we all will die, yes, but you freed us from the fear of death because we know you beat death. You broke those chains of death. We will be with you at the moment. We get to go home the minute, the second this life ends, we'll be with you. So in the meantime, Lord, work through us, speak through us, teach us, guide us that we may be your people right now and use us in a mighty way that others may know too. Jesus, you're not in the tomb. We know you're alive. Jesus, it's in your, your mighty name we pray. Amen and amen.
We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb has overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb has overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing Today, there's one traditional way to end the service. I'm going to say he is risen, and I want you to respond, he is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you for joining together as we celebrated Easter here this morning. Now go in the power of the risen Christ. Amen and amen. i